Good morning, Bethany Christian Church, and good morning to every single one that are listening to us here today. Today is Christmas Day, and it's a celebration all over the world. It's a celebration where our focus is on Jesus Christ, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, He's not a baby in a manger. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the ruler of all the earth for all eternity. And we celebrate that reality that Christ came, He accomplished His task, and He's coming back again. That's the purpose of the Advent, that He's also coming back again. He did not just come, but He comes back again. So, I think it's important, those of you who are here, those of you who are with your family, that you congratulate each other, that you can celebrate such, an, such a special occasion. Really, it's a special occasion for us once again to know and to realize that the Savior of this world, Jesus Christ, is our Lord and our Savior. Very personal, very, very personal it is indeed. And I really trust that you look around right now, just take your time and just wish each other and celebrate each other, with each other this reality that is in your life, Jesus Christ. We as a church unfortunately had to go back to the video setting because we can't have church at the moment because of the pandemic, the rules around the pandemic. Uh, one of our church members, this is me speaking, the, uh, the pastor, I was, uh, I was identified as a COVID carrier and even though I don't have any symptoms for more than a week, it was just wise for us once again not to expose or make or do the risk, or just make anybody else sit under the possibility of catching the same flu. We, we want to encourage you once again that you follow the rules, that you wash your hands, that you be very specific and very meticulous in uh, remaining, you know, keeping the spaces and, and wearing the mask, because these things are very, very important. We want you to live. God wants you to live. And that's why we keep on saying the same thing. But we'll enjoy Christmas even in a video setting here today. I believe that the Word of God will come to you and will be a blessing to you. There's nothing like the Word of God that can come to a man or to a woman. It's life-changing. The Word of God is life to those who find them and it's medicine to all their flesh, the Bible is saying. And I pray, God, that you and I will indeed honor Jesus' words where he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now I want you to read with me in your Bible, in the book of Luke. There are two portions of Scripture that I would love to read with you. One is from Luke chapter 2, and the other is from Philippians chapter 2. I just want to spend some time in Luke, because I really feel the, the presence of the Holy Spirit you know, repeating and saying the same thing to us through the last three messages that I have been preaching. And I really trust the Lord that you, have, you made the time and the effort to, to listen to it so that you don't miss when God speaks to you. Many times I hear people say to me, God doesn't speak to me anymore. But God speaks to us through many different ways. He speaks to us when we sit and read the Word. Because the Word of God is spirit breathe. And when you sit with the Word of God and you seek the Lord and you ask God to speak to you, He will. But we have the habit, unfortunately, where we don't read the Word of God. God speaks to us through the still small voice, but our busy lives doesn't make us to sit still and make time and be separate, be separated, you know, be separate and isolate ourselves, and like the Bible says in Psalms 46, be still and know that I'm God. And many times God will speak to you in a service like this, a life-changing confirmation word, a word that confirms what God has been saying over a number of weeks, maybe a number of years, maybe God has emphasized it recently, and now that you're not here, now that we are not sitting in a service set up, we miss the voice of God because we are not here. The Bible says we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. So, I want to read 
for that reason, I want to obey the Lord because I know that he, he emphasized, don't miss me, even in this significant time. And my message, by the way, is the significance of Christ, the significance of Jesus' birth, and that you and I must embrace that, that reality for us. Jesus Christ is the most significant person that you can ever walk on this earth, earth with. So I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 41. Now, you've, you might find it strange because Jesus is already a young boy here. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So they lost Jesus. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple. Can you imagine three days later? They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. The other portion of scripture, and I want you just to turn your Bibles to that specific portion, it is Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 to verse 11. Now I'm going to come back to the, the scripture, but I feel I, I just want to read it now, just for you to understand that there is another perspective that Paul gives us. Paul, he was the, one of the leading apostles. He wrote most of the New Testament, and he writes another perspective of the birth of Jesus Christ that you and I are celebrating today on this special day, Christmas Day. Now listen to this. I actually want to read from verse 4 because it tells us the mindset, the attitude of Christ that God wants us to have. Let each of you Look out not only for his own interest, this is typical Jesus, but also for the interest of others. Isn't that beautiful? Listen to verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, listen to this very carefully, it introduces the person that we're speaking about here. Paul is writing about Jesus is coming to Bethlehem, Jesus is coming to the earth, and he makes sure that we understand that we're talking about Jesus as God. God while he was still in heaven. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. By the way, in the Greek language, there is no word for bond servant. There is only a word. This specific word is a slave. So it's interesting to see the categories when it comes to following the Lord, when it comes to serving God. You're a son, or you're a servant, or you're a slave. One of those three. Many of us never progress to being a slave of God. We are sons, and we are proud of that identity. We avail ourselves willingly and give our service to the Lord. But that is many times periodically. Then there is a slave. Jesus went as far as becoming a bondservant, a slave. And coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those in the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Very important portion of Scripture. I'll come back to that right now. 
But I just want you, once again, because we are celebrating this wonderful occasion that Jesus Christ finally came to earth. Now you can just imagine what went through the minds and the hearts of the people during that time because the period between the, the last verse of Malachi, in other words, the end of the Old Testament, and the first verse of Matthew chapter 1, there's a period of 400 years of silence before Jesus Christ was introduced, the coming of Jesus and the birth of Jesus. 400 years of absolute silence. There was no prophet. There was no inspirational preaching. There was no one to encourage them. And this is why it's so important for you and I to understand that you need to stand on the Word of God because there will come times in your life where you don't know or don't hear. Then you better know what God used to say to you, what God said to you the last time because the last word that God spoke to you, that is what will keep you. That is what will stabilize you. This is why we need to, like these people, I'm talking about 400 years 400 years later, many of these people were aware of the Messiah's coming. They just didn't know that is coming at this specific time. And it's interesting, when you read the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 4, as we've quoted in our last sermon, that at the appointed time, in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus. Right there, at the right time, when the Roman Empire still had the control or the rule uh, and even, you know, a, a dominant rule over the people of, of Israel. Jesus came during such a time. I want you to know this is the God that, that you and I serve, and I want you to take notice of that, that when you experience the darkest times, the, the times of, of silence, I want you to know that is the time that you need to expect God to, uh, God to come through for you. Expect God to, to communicate with you. Your expectation is God's invitation. Never give up. Never give up. Don't ever be convinced that, that, that the heavens are bronze, that the heavens are closed. No, the heavens are not closed. You knock on there. You, are, you, you must be determined to hear from God. Sometimes it's our desperate situation, our desperation in our desperate situation, our desperation in our desperate situation that determines whether you'll hear from God. Many a believer have experienced this. The Bible declares weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. So I'm encouraging you here they're just like they, during a time of silence, never heard, and then Christ was born. Then the answer came. Then the solution of the world came. This is what we're celebrating here, that the solution, the answer, the Redeemer, the Savior has come. This is what you and I are supposed to celebrate here today. Amen. I really trust that you follow God come and God has come in the midnight hour. You remember the story of the bridegroom? And they waited, and they waited for the bridegroom to come. And in the midnight hour, almost when it was just seemed to be too late, Jesus came. Now I'm sharing this because we have never seen a generation in our lifetime. In our lifetime, we see a despondency. We see a hopelessness. We see a generation that doesn't have hope. This pandemic has made and has challenged our convictions, has challenged our foundations, and we see the world is looking for an anchor. They are looking for hope. And this is the message that we need to bring. There is hope against hope. Even though it seems dark, Jesus Christ came to his disciples during the third watch. When nobody could catch anything, he came, calmed the storm, and helped them to catch what they couldn't do. He's not, a, he's not unaware of where you are. And I want to encourage you this morning that you remember the birth of Christ came at such a time to God's people. 
Now, I want to take you to this story because this story happens when Jesus was 12 years old. This is now the, the parents are taking him once again. This is the 12th time that they're taking him to the Passover. It's a feast where you think, if you think about it, they should know of all people that this feast is actually about Jesus. Just like we have it right now. You know, people have a tendency to forget what this feast is about. That's why I'm saying the Holy Spirit is impressing on my heart to remind God's people, to remind people in general that they become realistic, that they become honest, that they become transparent, that they become real about this time. That you, be, that you acquaint yourself with the scriptures of what God is saying about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the church many times missed it completely. We missed it like Mary and Joseph seem to have missed it completely here. To think that they, after all these years of taking Jesus to the Passover, who's actually about the Lamb of God, their very own son, if they really think about it, and you know, at this very feast, with all its busyness and festivities, and all the, you know, the fellowship and the assembling of all the people, just like we have right now, they lost Jesus. They found themselves without their son. They found themselves without Christ, without the Lord Jesus Christ. One day later in their traveling, they realized Jesus wasn't near. Jesus wasn't here. This is where we find ourselves many times. Here's Mary of all people. And I don't want to park here today. I just want to remind you that God is speaking to the church, that the church, like Mary, who is supposed to have the closest, most intimate relationship with Jesus, her son, imagine that the angel and all of these other divine encounters that she had I'm talking about an intimate relationship with the Lord. And during a feast, she lost him. The church, in many ways, have lost the Lord Jesus Christ in the celebration of this feast. Not aware that he's not here. Not aware that Jesus Christ are not in the place any longer. That is an indictment against the church. And I pray, God, that we as a, as, a, as a local body will wake up to the reality that the church is about its head, Jesus Christ. The church is about its foundation, Jesus Christ. He holds all things together. The reason why you are breathing here today, the, the, the reason why we can celebrate this today, the reason why we, why we can sit here and listen to the Word of God is because of Jesus. He holds all things together. Jesus does. Jesus does. I pray that you won't lose Him. I pray that you won't find out that He's not with you any longer. Now, allow me to say this because the book of John, chapter 10, verse 27, emphasized the fact that Jesus said, no one shall pluck you out of my hand. Mary and Joseph didn't end, or, you know, they did not, <clears throat> they continued to be the parents of Jesus. But what was lost was the fellowship. And many times we have relationship with the Lord, but we don't continue in our fellowship with the Lord. They discovered this a day later and, and, and seeking him among relatives and seeking him amongst friends and, and, and the caravan, the people that they traveled with, they had to go back and three days later, three days later without fellowshipping with the Lord, they discovered that he was at the temple. Now I pray God that you hear what the Lord is saying to us here, here today. It is fellowship that will boost and root your relationship. A lack of fellowship is dangerous. Yes, you won't lose your relationship with the Lord, but let me tell you, a continuous lack of fellowship with the Lord, where you come into the presence of God and deal and, and be transparent and read the Word of God and bow before the Lord and sing His songs and, and, and pray from the bottom of your heart, connecting with God, that is fellowship. That is sharing your heart. 
Let us share in your mind and your tears and your dreams and your fears. You involve the Lord. The Bible said if we draw near to him, he draws near to us. But if we don't draw near, we don't give him an opportunity to draw near. The onus and the responsibility is on us. And the onus and the responsibility was on Mary and Joseph to keep and to keep their focus on the Son of God. So church of Jesus Christ, Bethany Christian Church here, and everybody else who's watching here, I want you to know, if you lose your focus, you will find there's an absence of His presence. If you lose your focus, you will discover that He's not even amongst your good company. And this is where we miss it many times because we think because I'm in good company, I'm in good fellowship with people, you know, there's a responsibility about you individually to keep your focus on Jesus. It's not other people's responsibility, it is your responsibility. And we must come to the place and we must make this decision, you may, maybe on this Christmas day, that I will never, ever, and I never, ever want to be without the presence of Jesus. We're talking about the manifest presence of God. I'm not talking about the omnipresence of God. In other words, God is everywhere. God is to be found if you seek Him. God says, if you seek me, I will be found of you in Jeremiah 29, verse 12 and verse 13. If you seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you. So I'm praying, God, that in this time of celebration, in this time of feasting, they came to the Passover, and the feasting and the activities occupied their minds and their attention, and the fellowship with others occupied their minds and their attention, and they missed and lost the Lord Jesus. They did not miss Jesus because they were rebellious. They did not miss Jesus because they, uh, they were indifferent. They missed him because they assumed that he was there. They missed him through presumption and assumption. And this is where we many times take the presence of God, the word of God, the songs that we've heard, the convictions that God has placed us under, we take this for granted we assume that this will always come. Who tell you, who is telling you that God will speak again about this same subject? This might be the last time that God will speak to you about a relationship, a job opportunity, that God will speak to you about the ministry, your involvement. God will only knock so much on your heart's door. You know what really touched my heart is that they did not know that he wasn't there. They did not even know. And this is where, as a church, but we find ourselves many times, and in my relationship, we just make assumptions about the Lord. As an anointed person, like a Samson, even though he was anointed and chosen, he himself did not know that. The Bible says he wished not that the Spirit of God has left him. Like the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. It's the only church where Jesus was outside, but knocking on that door, determining to come in. And when they found him, they found him in the temple. Let me close with this, with this portion, with this specific section because I want you to know that they had to go back to the place where they left him. They left him at the temple. The temple is the place of worship. It's the place of the presence of God. It's the place of the assembly of the saints. And I pray, God, that many of you will hear my heart here this morning when I say to you that you don't use the pandemic as an excuse not to attend the assembly. And you might say, yes, but uh, I, I'm listening to video church. Really? Are you doing that because you want to avoid uh, this, this specific disease for a reason? Truly? 
Many people find themselves celebrating amongst family, walking around in shopping centers, and then they have the audacity to say, I can't come to church. Now we will have church again here on the 10th of, on the 10th of January. And I pray, God, that you hear my heart, that you hear what God is saying to you. Forsake not the assembly of the saints. We can have organized meetings. We can have organized meetings. Don't use the pandemic as an excuse. We're supposed to respect and honor the word of God, even in this regard. But it seems like we have more honor and respect for the government, more honor and respect for sickness and disease than for this. I'm not disregarding the rules. I'm not disrespecting the rules. I'm just saying, don't justify yourself while you know that you could have made an effort. I pray, I pray God that, that that actually registers in your heart and that comes through. Let us listen to the Lord when He speaks to us. Go back to the place where you left Him. Maybe you used to pray quite a bit. Maybe you used to get up early in the morning. Maybe you used to read the Bible at specific times and specific portions. Maybe you used to sing the songs and take your guitar and take the, and take the piano or take your, your, your CD player or, or just tune into YouTube. Maybe you used to do that. Go back and do this again. Go back and do this again. How can you have a meaningful relationship without fellowship? How can you have a love relationship without the presence of your lover? Many times we miss so many opportunities just because we don't nurture a love, love relationship that is very important to God. A love relationship with you did you notice that, that the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, the church of brotherly love, where they show and demonstrate brotherly love, love for God and love for the church, it's the only church where there was an open door and doors of opportunity. And I pray, God, that you hear my heart here today that that the feast and the distraction and all the busyness of the feast won't put you in the position where Mary and Joseph found themselves, where they had to go back. And then they hear this answer from Jesus. You say, why did you seek me? As if I'm lost. That's basically what Jesus is saying. I'm not lost. And he said this, I must be about my father's business. And so for that reason, I want to go back to Philippians chapter 2 because Jesus has not forgotten why he came to the earth. Jesus has not forgotten that after this 400 years of silence, after the announcement of the angels to, the, uh, to, to Joseph and to all these other role players, Elizabeth and her husband, as well as the shepherds, Jesus understood why this divine intervention, why heaven came to earth. And I pray God that you and I will remember from heaven's perspective it was important for us to understand what took place when Jesus came to Bethlehem, when Jesus came and, be and, and became a man. What took place from heaven's perspective? Sometimes we don't realize that Jesus wasn't just a prophet. Jesus wasn't just another man in history. Jesus wasn't just an, just an important person that the calendar is, is, is literally written about. Because right now we are about to go into 2021, the year of the Lord. That Lord that they speak about is the Lord Jesus. By the way, speaking of the first service, on the 3rd of, 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 of January, I ask you that you prepare yourself and that you get communion elements ready. So even if you're at home, that you come ready with the communion elements so that we can actually uh, just celebrate.
this new year and embrace this year of the Lord 2021 in the right fashion. Now, if you go back to this Philippians chapter 2, it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This is heaven's view of Jesus. As far as heaven is concerned, we talk about God coming to earth. God coming to earth. And yes, we are acquainted with the name Jesus. It's a common cultural name, Yeshua. It's a name that, that was very common. Many people had this name. But there's something about this name that happens when you say that and embrace it believingly. When your focus is on the fact that he's the Redeemer, the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God, Jesus is his name. The Bible says that through faith in his name, the man in the book of Acts was raised. He was lame for more than 30 years and through faith in the name. It's faith in this name that makes the difference. You can't just use the name of Jesus. Sometimes we think, and many people think that if they pronounce it correctly from a, from a Greece, Greek perspective or a Hebrew perspective, as it's written in the Bible that the devil will shake in, in his boots, that the devil will, will all of a sudden run. Just because you say Yeshua HaMashiach doesn't mean the devil will run. You must believe in the person behind the name. So God gave him this name, and this is what this specific scripture is telling us. His name is Jesus the Anointed. It says Christ Jesus. The anointed Jesus. There's a difference when we talk about Jesus and we talk about Christ Jesus, the Messiah Jesus. The one that you believe in as the Messiah, the Redeemer, the King. It's a big difference. The one who's God before he came. And you'll notice if we, once again, just follow the scripture from verse 5 right to verse 11, it describes his coming, and then it ends over the fact that he, as far as Paul is concerned, writing from heaven's perspective, they call him at the end, Jesus Christ is Lord. As far as heaven is concerned, he was God when he came, and as far as heaven is concerned, he's still God, and he is still the Lord of Lords. What does the word Lord means? It means owner. It means possessor. I'm talking, about, I'm talking to you this morning that when we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's perspective, we are celebrating someone who is God Almighty. Someone who is the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings. Jesus did not forget this at the age of 12. And I don't want you to forget that while you're celebrating this time. Maybe, maybe we must be honest with ourselves. If you're just having a holiday, then please just have a holiday. But if you're really celebrating the Lord, then understand who you're dealing with. You are dealing with the living God, the possessor of heaven and earth, the Lord of all lords, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. It's interesting that the angel wanted them to remember that they call him Emmanuel. You'll notice that the, in the word Emmanuel, the last two letters is L. That is God with us. L means God. It's the incarnate Son. God became a man. And that you never forget the story. It's not about a baby in a manger. It's about God coming and became a man for a specific purpose, for a specific reason. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's not lose focus of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this portion of Scripture, that Paul writes about, he said that Jesus emptied himself. He emptied himself. There are a number of things that I can mention here today that he emptied himself of because he was determined. 
to come to earth for this message from heaven that earth needed to hear. The angels really tried their very best saying, glory to God in the highest. They talk about good tidings of great joy. I want you to know if you really sit still and interpret this. Heaven sent Jesus because heaven values you. You matter to heaven. I matter to heaven. We matter then and we matter now. You're, you are more important to God than even your sin. Sin has an agenda. Sin has an agenda to keep you and separate you from God for all eternity. That is why Jesus came to meet the demands of sin. The Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. God wants you to have the glory of God back. That is why Jesus Christ came and to pay the price and meet the demands of sin so that you and I can once again be joined as the sons and the daughters of God, just like it is, it is shared in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Heaven loves you. Heaven loves you. Heaven loves you. Jesus called this my father's business. I'm about my father's business. I came to seek and save the lost. That is the father's business. He don't want you to be lost. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be his. He don't want you to bear the consequences of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death like in separation from God for all eternity. God doesn't want you to have that. I pray God that you hear his heart here today. Let me just share with you a few things that I believe that Jesus Christ emptied himself of. He emptied himself of his glory. He emptied himself of his glory. In the book of John chapter 17, the first four, four or five verses, Jesus is praying. It's the very famous chapter where Jesus is praying. Now I want you to know who you are dealing with here today. Jesus Christ came to live as a man, an anointed man. He came and embraced the word of God, eat and live the word of God as an anointed man so that you and I have the courage and the example and the standard that you can do this too. That is why he said right at the beginning in Matthew chapter 4 and, Matthew cha and Luke chapter 4, when he encountered the devil, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He lived from the word of God. He lived and based his convictions, his resurrection, his ministry, everything was based on the word of God. That is how you're supposed to live. That is how I am supposed to live. So he emptied himself of his glory, and he prays here in John 17, and he says, Father, the glory that I had with you. And he prays that he will have that glory back once again. So he emptied himself, and you remember the story when Peter, James, and John went with Jesus to the mountain of transfiguration, where Jesus, just for a short moment, where Jesus just lifted the veil, you know, where his glory was seen. He lifted the veil. In other words, his glory was veiled. So he lifted the veil, and the mountain of transfiguration, they saw him in his glory. And you know, they were stunned, they were amazed, they didn't even, they spoke incoherently, they did not, they did not even know what to do. Lord, shall we build tents for you or what? They were amazed. John, the beloved John who had a close relationship with Jesus, I mean, you talk about someone who's close to Jesus in the book of Revelations, when he saw the glorified Christ, he fell in front of him like a dead man, I'm talking to you, we don't know who we're dealing with here today. We're talking about when we celebrate this specific birth, we celebrate the Lord of Lords and the King of Glory. One day, He will rule you. One day, 
you will have to bow down just like the scripture in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 to 11 is saying, every tongue shall confess and every, and every knee shall bow that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's better to do it now that you're alive. Bow before him and acknowledge him as King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible say of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those in the underworld. So if you are not right in your relationship with God here on earth, and those of us, or of course the believers who are in heaven, let me tell you, everybody will be in agreement that he is Lord. There will come a time when every single body, it doesn't matter whether you are in opposition and in rebellion right now, whether you are too smart for God, there will come a day when you'll have to bow the knee and you'll have to say, Yes, you are the king of kings, the ruler of all the ages, the Lord of lords, the possessor of heaven and earth for all eternity. Secondly, he emptied himself of his honor. Many times we as believers, we can do ourselves a favor by go read the book of Isaiah 53 again, once again. Go read what what Isaiah who prophesied hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus. He's telling us what heaven is preparing for Jesus Christ. What Jesus is willing, willing to do. Because he wants to save mankind back to God. This is this message that is all about. In fact, the Bible said there was no beauty. We talk about the Rose of Sharon. We talk about the darling of heaven. We talk about the bright morning star. We talk about the desire of the nations. That is the titles, that is the description of Jesus. But when he came to earth, there was no beauty that he should be desired. He was despised. He was whipped. He was spat on. He was made a fool of by fools. And he was rejected and shamed. By the way, when you listen to all of this, despised, worked, spat on, made a fool of, rejected, shame. He took that so that you and I don't have to live in shame. So that you and I don't have to live being despised and rejected and not feeling good enough, not feeling accepted. He took that upon himself so that you can have your dignity back. That is one of the reasons that Jesus Christ came back, to restore you back to glory, to restore you back to the status of being a heavenly citizen with heavenly origins, with a heavenly nature. He gave up his honor to think that all heaven bows before him. And here on earth, people use his name as a swear word. Here on earth, people just talk to him when they want, how they want. We as a church, we call ourselves the church of Jesus Christ, but we live as if we can do our own thing. We can just do our own thing. Here on this special day, I want you to know that Jesus gave up his riches, just like 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse, verse 9 tells us. He came and lived a humble life. He came to live a normal, humble life. Sometimes we are moved by all the wealth and the resources and the assets that we have. Let me tell you, God is very comfortable in a palace and in a pondoki. He's very comfortable in a humble sitting and in heaven with all the glory that heaven represents and all the riches. You talk about, you talk about riches, it is unimaginable. Unimaginable. And we think that we can get along without God because we have some resources. Many people, their identity is just in their resources. We think that money makes this world go round. I have news for you. This is just one pandemic that has shaken the world, shaken the markets, and if you read the Bible, 
you understand that the end times will be more catastrophic than you think. If your faith is in your investments, I want you to know God did not make you to have faith in your investments. He says, have faith in God. Have faith in God. He gave up his own will. This is where I mentioned earlier on that Jesus was not just the son. He wasn't just a servant, and believe me, he was. But he was also a slave, or like the scripture is telling us, a bond servant. A slave has no will. A slave must listen to what his owner is saying and what his owner instructs him. That is why Jesus continuously said, Not my will, but thy will be done. He said, I've come to please my Father. I only do those things which I hear and see my Father does. I want you to hear this Jesus gave up his own will so that he can fulfill God's desire for you and for me. He gave up the personal exercise, exercise of his authority. Let me just have water. I have a few minutes left. And then I need to land because I don't want you to miss this is what Paul is seeing from heaven's perspective. Who are you dealing with? This unselfish person. Just like I read earlier on. That each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. This was the mindset of Jesus. This is what he was giving up. Jesus came and he demonstrated to us to live under authority and exercise the authority of Scripture over life, over demons, and over devils. It can be done. It can be done. He assigned us to do that. He said, all authority has been given unto me after he, has, after he was risen from the dead. Therefore you go, cast out de devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number five, I want you to hear. He gave up the use of his omniscience. In other words, the fact that he knows everything. Jesus is the one that decided. Jesus said, only the Father knows when the Son of Man is coming back. He gave that up. He gave that knowledge. He gave up. Just like you many times and I, we choose not to know. When uh, we expected our children, when my Renee was pregnant with, 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 with Karen, we wanted to know whether it's a boy or a girl. And the technology wasn't as advanced, and so we asked the doctor. And uh, right before he gave us an answer, we decided, no, we don't want to know. He gave up. Even though he could, he did not, he chose not to. Next point is that he gave up his omnipotence. Omnipotence means he's all-powerful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, if I wanted to, I can ask 12 legions to come and defend me right now. At my will, I could have done that. I gave up that right that I have because he was God, but he suppressed and emptied these specific rights that he had. And he operated as an anointed man. He operated as an, a man anointed by the Spirit of God. He gave up his favorable relationship with his Father when he became sin for you and for me. And it was the most painful thing. And that heart's cry from Jesus at the cross when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God could not look and fellowship with sin. He still can't do that. He still can't do that. Don't let sin separate you from God. Jesus wanted to maintain his relationship with the Father. That only happens when there's no sin. That's why you must examine your heart. You know, next week when we take communion, 
That is when you examine yourself because your relationship is that important. You don't want anything wrong to separate or to, to, to cause a distance between you and God. Examine. Many of us, we do in this time business transactions, but you examine your account. You examine whether you have the money before you do that. Unfortunately, there are some who don't do that, and you find yourself in trouble. And this is what happened to many believers. We don't examine, we don't really search our hearts, or ask the Lord to search our hearts and our thoughts, because our relationship with God is that important. If we can sum it up, we basically say Jesus gave up his privileges. He gave up all his heavenly privileges. From a human standpoint, it's many times tough for most of us, if we're honest, to give up our privileges for somebody else, our comfort for somebody else, our abilities and powers for somebody else. But this one, used his abilities. Jesus used his abilities and his privileges for our benefit, for your benefit. That is why we celebrate Jesus here today, the most unselfish person that ever walked the face of God's earth. He came for me. He came for you. He came to seek and to save you. He came to give you a reason to live came to allow you to experience heaven on earth, heaven's purpose for you here on earth. That is why Jesus came. I pray, God, that you hear God's heart here today. That you hear God's heart here today. That Christmas Day not just be another celebration of food and festivities and family and fun and friends. No, that's okay with the Lord. Just be honest about it. That for you, maybe it's not about the Lord. Maybe it's about the flavor or the atmosphere or the season that everybody seems to embrace in this kind of spirit. But for us, life is Christ. To die is gain, but to live is Christ. And especially on this memorable occasion, And I celebrate heaven coming down to earth in the person of Jesus. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a promise keeper, that you keep and kept your word, and that you will always keep your word. The Bible says that forever your word is established in heaven, that God is not a man that he should lie, and that he's watching over his word to perform it. And you said in your word that the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus is his name. And we bow before him this morning and acknowledge him as our Lord, as our possessor and owner as our Savior and our Redeemer. We acknowledge Him as the Son of the living God. We acknowledge Him as King of all kings and Lord of all lords. All authority belongs to Him. And we, like the wise men, Lord God, seek to show Him our worship and honor and regard. May it be So for many families and friends as they gather together on this special day, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Next week, on the 3rd of of January, we will have another video service, and we invite you, if you have family and friends, wherever you are, make time to sit under the Word of God. I trust God for a word for the new year, that you can have something solid to live from, to live by, and to make part and part parcel 
of your motivation for 2021. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen.